Have you seen the future? I am the future. Welcome to this look at some of the best worst vanity projects ever made, which I've arranged as a top 10 to make it more palatable to anyone expecting chirpy swipes at Battlefield Earth. Ah! Crap, lousy ceiling! The term vanity project means different things to different people, but I'm talking about movies written by, directed by, and starring the same person. Ideally, a lunatic egotist with a tank top, a sex pond, and a god complex. I am not of this earth. Nanaland.com coined the term egosploitation to describe such films, because what unites them is the unbridled egotism of those responsible, delusioneers who have little to no ability behind the camera, and whose childishly idealized on-screen avatars demonstrate similar limitations in front of it, whether acting, singing, or scat yodeling. <laughs> On that note, let's get on with it. Christian Anders is an Austrian singer, composer and author who achieved German pop stardom in the 1970s and bartered it into a martial arts odyssey that brings to mind delusioneers from Steven Seagal to Tommy Wiseau. Get out of here! Oh, Thomas, it's you. In Roots of Evil, he plays Frank Mertens, the sensei of a Spanish karate dojo who finds himself in a feud with Deep Roy's millionaire supercriminal Van Bullock. Despite operating an international drugs ring, Van Bullock's real ambition is to run a modest karate school in a suburban house, and that places him in competition with Frank, who, to further complicate matters, happens to have been taught by Van Bullock's old enemy, Takemura. Takemura? Takemura? The dirty dog? It's kind of a remake of Fist of Fury, and its star certainly likes impersonating Bruce Lee. His skills seem limited, though, and time that should have been spent fighting is too often spent posing. It's extraordinary how many of these movies can be described that way. Bruce Lee seems to be the model for every other childlike wannabe with a camera, a six-pack, and an ego. Then it was you who killed my master. Yes. It was me. It was very easy. Another notable entry in the Bruce exploitation meets ego exploitation sub 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 genre is the Incredible City Dragon, in which everyone who isn't Bruce Lee is Rudy Ray Moore. Oh condom, oh condom, I love thee so much for protecting my stuff and keeping me alive today for one more row in the. Hey! People are still homaging Bruce Lee today, and you could do worse than check out Shuni B's Fight of Fury. What are you saying? This guy, out of nowhere, shows up, starts defending her! And has only directed one further movie in 1981's Divine Emmanuel, before reinventing himself as a conspiracy theorist. Apparently, his early adoption of anti-vaxxer principles has made him relevant again in his homeland, but I prefer to think of his true legacy as directing Deep Roy to this performance. No, Como! You already failed once! Next time you do as I say! In genre terms, martial arts and horror dominate the vanity project field, and a good rule of thumb is to assume the kick-fighting ones will offer more vanity, and the bloodletting ones more product. The fact is, self-funded action movies tend to be made by people looking to promote themselves as super cool action heroes, which, assuming they're unqualified, is inherently funny. I think you better get in there, mate. It looks like you've had a bit of trouble with tonight. What? What happened? Me. Self-funded horror movies tend to be made by people who simply want to make a horror movie. You know what horror people are like. All they really want to do is kill things. When horror filmmakers are on screen, it's usually just because someone had to be, and it looked like a laugh. But, as we'll see, the best vanity projects aren't only about promoting weird people. Some of them are about promoting their weird ideas, too. We're the only Christians left in the world. The most extraordinary example of this might be The Empiricist, in which former MD Warren Metzler uses prosthetics and historical reenactments no, to explain why medicine should be replaced with magic water. That's not managed care. That's insane care. But The Astrologer is almost like a real movie, so I'm going to go with that instead. We use first names and everything of all my friends. We'll get them in the show, and um, it'll be about the adventures of an astrologer around the world. We'll call it The Astrologer. 
Self-financed by mysterious New Age prophet Craig Denny, it's a self-aggrandizing alternative autobiopic in which our hero outgrows his carny fortune teller roots to become a diamond smuggler in Kenya. Don't kill me! And then a sailor on Tahiti, which was apparently all part of a master plan. Now I had the power to be what I've always wanted to be, the world's greatest mystic. He winds up so rich he has an art gallery in his garden, and so meta he makes a movie about his own life. Which means this is Denny playing himself, and this is Denny playing himself playing himself. You might expect that to be the most confusing part of the movie, but it isn't. When angular Mars is partile, opposition to angular Neptune, and square to angular Uranus, the double approaching square of Mars to angular Uranus suggests a release of tension to the opposing quadrant. Sadly, the astrologer only saw a limited theatrical run and due to it stealing all its music, wasn't released on home formats. Plans to follow up with a full slate of major productions fell through and Denny's said to have passed away a few years later. Though rumours abound he faked his own death and someone else was buried in his grave. Do you know who that was? No, sir. Either way, he wasn't able to realise his dream of becoming a famous TV astrologer. And that's the real tragedy. You're just about ready to blow up with Uranus there in your first house at the present time. Uranus, you know, is a planet of explosions, but it's an erratic, eccentric planet, and it brings good suddenly, and it brings bad suddenly. Go on, we're moving in, and you guys can't move. Too bad. Have a good time with it, all guys. <laughs> Shadow of the Dragon's Delusionaire appears far less egocentric, but he still has much to offer. As a character actor, Jimmy Williams enjoyed a formidable hit rate, having appeared in Gold Star classics including Cybernator, Samurai Cop, Shut up. and Killing American Style, which sees him perform one of cinema's finest deaths. Tony! He turned to directing after co-writing a screenplay about two LA cops tracking criminal mastermind the Mekong Dragon, so with co-finance from a NASA computer scientist he met playing golf, Jimmy Williams made Shadow of the Dragon a thing. It's not as eventful as some of the movies on this list and won't be to everyone's taste, but the former bodybuilder's incredibly good company in what's unsurprisingly the biggest and best role of his career, as Detective Sergeant Tony Baker, a likably world-weary 1970s-style TV cop. I gotta cut down on the lasagna. There's an unusual soothing quality to everything that's partly down to the director's vague style and writing, and partly down to the peculiar ADR. Son of a bitch. He's gone. Let's see if we can find out who's supposed to be on duty here. Are you on duty here? Yes, I've been here for three hours. Money was tight and the film was shot piecemeal over the course of three years, which meant many of the actors weren't available when it came time to dub their performances. So, aside from Williams and a few others including Robert Zadar, the voices are all done by sound man and producer Bill Mills. Everything from this woman... You won't get away with this. ...to William Smith. <laughs> oh, you beautiful green bitch. Anytime the military has an operation that can't fail, they call this guy in to train the troops, okay? He's the kind of guy that would drink a gallon of gasoline so he could piss in your campfire. You could drop this guy off at the Arctic Circle wearing a pair of bikini underwear without his toothbrush, and tomorrow afternoon he's going to show up at your poolside with a million-dollar smile and a fistful of pesos. On Deadly Ground is Steven Seagal's only directorial outing and came at the height of his post-Under Siege pomp, after the original hair plugs had bedded in, but before the allegations of <laughs> lactating. Ooh, that's disgusting. What is that, halibut? I really enjoy this thing, but I wasn't sure whether to include it because I may be the only one. Plus, it's far too competent, obvious, and slow in the middle. But the first act's fantastic bar scene perfectly illustrates the difference between an ordinary vanity project and rampant ego exploitation. Are you a man? Oh, Jesus. My own man. Yeah, come on, man. I got a big pair of balls right between my legs. In it, Seagal plays the great protector and has everyone in the room standing around in awe as he shows off. It's brilliant stuff, but the thing is, he really is an Aikido master. Say what you like about him, and I think we all should. He was the real deal. It can be funny, but this is how action heroes often were. Ego exploitation requires another step. And this is the moment Steven Seagal made it. 
What does it take? What does it take to change the essence of a man? I need time to change. It transpires he isn't just a cool and heroic Aikido master, he's also a spiritual prodigy whose wisdom can change the nature of man, which means he can both fight a bear and deliver a seven minute lecture on his concerns about offshore drilling. How many of you out there have heard of alternative engines? Now that's ego exploitation. Who the hell are you? They call me Zeus. The killer? Yeah, the crime killer. After ruffling too many feathers downtown, Detective Zeus is kicked off the force in a scene I want to be buried with. I have a right to protect myself. And I have a right to protect myself because those people out there need me. And they need me because I care about them. And when I go out on a mission, I do the right job! It goes on for ages and we learn Zeus is so popular with his colleagues that one starts shooting the place up in outrage. At first, Zeus is plagued by nightmares about all the crime that isn't getting killed. But it isn't long before the chief shows up looking for help with a case. Someone keeps changing his tie when he isn't looking and it scared his moustache white. Also, the president's ex-wife's had her throat slit. Jesus! Zeus begins his investigation by having a child randomly select a suspect. This one! Who he then approaches for questioning in a typically professional manner. I want you to keep your mouth shut and follow me. What do you mean, follow you? You talk too much. Boom! Then, just as things aren't making much sense, they suddenly make no sense at all as we cut to a military training camp where Zeus is being drilled. You fucking primadonnas! I'm gonna cut your fucking throat! Exercise presumably over, he and his friends tool up to presumably go get the bad guys, who they've presumably identified. But unfortunately, they're too late. Yo, man, they got him! What? Oh, no! What happened to the security cars? They were shot, that's what happened to fucking security... The authorities really should have had someone else working this case too. The president's life seems like it might be important. They could at least have got a SEAL team in to do the stealth raid on the villain's compound instead of leaving it to Zeus and his mates. There isn't much information out there on Pan Andreas. His IMDb bio appears to be self-penned and hard to verify. He mentioned starring in Broadway productions, but there's no record of him on the Internet Theatre database. In the 70s, he did appear in a few TV shows though, including an episode of Kojak. Hurting me. You're hurting me. He left the industry after Crime Killer, but in 2017 attempted a return with a movie about matadors, in which age doesn't seem to hold him back. And he allegedly has a biopic of Pontius Pilate in the works too, naturally starring himself as the Roman Emperor who crucified Christ. If it features dialogue like Crime Killers, I'm in. Is that all you care about? Justice and Uzu? The most entertaining Vanity Project avatars are comically idealised versions of the filmmakers responsible for them. It doesn't matter whether they want to be tough, talented or wise, what's important is an abundance of ego and a lack of self-awareness. Who I am is none of your concern. And what I do is out of your control. I have a theory such delusioneers can reveal more of themselves in their work than real artists might. The same lack of awareness that makes their movie inadvertently entertaining prevents them realising what and how much of themselves they're revealing. My heart, my stomach, I mean, my liver, everything! It just fell right out onto the floor! It's usually just a desire to be the toughest, wisest, most hardcore person in the room. So it's odd the best known, best worst vanity project was made by someone who, based on their paper-thin pseudonym, isn't worried about being tough, clever or wise. He just wants to be loved. If a lot of people love each other, the world would be a better place to live. I tried to find an excuse not to cover the room. No matter how deserving, it's been done to death. But it seemed wrong without it, so here's a few brief words. Oh, hi. Not those words. As I implied, filmmaker Tommy Wiseau's avatar is unusual. Johnny's meant to be pretty cool. He's got the Benz, the surfer buddy. Denny. I just like to watch you guys. But he's not exactly Forrest Taft, and the only person he shoots is himself. God. Forgive me. What he is is popular. Everyone's always telling him how great he is. And he's also betrayed, which means everything here. Everybody betray me. I don't have a friend in the world. 
The room's the ultimate example of a delusioneer revealing their inner desires, insecurities, and emotional damage. Despite it not happening as that delusioneer intended, it genuinely speaks to people, and for that deserves at least some respect. I don't know why, but this is my favorite line. I'm gonna do what I wanna do, and that's it. What do you think I should do? Another infamous avatar who seems to reveal his creator's deep-seated desire for friendship and belonging is Miami Connection's unassuming Mark. I don't want to have any trouble. I just get the job from Asian. Don't bother us. But as great a bad movie as this is, it's pretty half-hearted ego exploitation. YK Kim just plays a nice guy and only directed a few reshoots, so I have an excuse to cover New York Ninja instead. The Ninja. It's gotta be. may already know it, but the New York Ninja story goes thus. In 1984, Taiwanese action actor John Liu, who will always be the armpits and groin guy to me, armpits, groin, shot a kung fu vigilante movie on the streets of New York. But before editing could begin, the production company folded, and the negatives were consigned to a vault. 35 years later, Vinegar Syndrome found them and appointed filmmaker Curtis Spieler to turn them into a movie. Well, if it isn't the ninja... Uh, uh. Liu plays John, a TV sound engineer who seems completely unaware of what happens to couples like this in genre movies made in 1980s New York. I'm pregnant. Really? Seriously? We're gonna have a baby. Oh my god. I'm gonna be a daddy. Are you happy? Yes. I love you. Five minutes later, she's dead. <laughs> so, after a brief period of mourning... John becomes a ninja avenger, a superhero in all but name taking out creeps wherever he finds them, which is everywhere because this is 1980s New York. But because he has a day job with a TV news channel, John needs to Clark Kent his colleagues after every shenanigan. Where'd he come from? Where did he go? Hey, did I miss anything? Yes, yes you, you did. did. Oh. There's lots for him to do, too, because the plutonium killer's on the loose. And I'm not quite sure what his objectives are, but it's an excuse for all kinds of things. <coughs> the fight scenes are the backbone of the movie, though, and they have everything. Good, bad, cool and stupid. This isn't just some random lost film resurrected in blissful HD. The raw material's priceless. The additions work too, most prominently the score from Retro Trio Voyager 3 and the voice cast, which features Linnea Quigley and Cynthia Rothrock. Normally they'd be too good for a movie like this, but Don the Dragon Wilson's a perfect fit. Uh, I'm guessing this was because of you? It wasn't me, it was the New York Ninja. Oh yeah? The New <laughs> York Ninja's a real hero. You're right. <laughs> Who are you? Another drug-contaminated devil worshipper from Hollywood? I don't do drugs or worship the devil. This is Rick. He was on the police force for seven years and now he drives a limousine. In the early 90s, struggling actor John DeHart was shimmy sliding his way towards middle age when he concluded that he wasn't about to be handed his big break and would have to fashion it himself from whatever resources he could muster. The resulting concoction is crime thriller Road to Revenge, or Champagne and Bullets, or Get Even, because each time a distributor turned it down, he cut a new version, without ever thinking to lose this kind of thing. Tonight is a night for me and you. Please, baby, don't let me down. Lay your body here on Earth's ground. The movies are about a pair of cops played by DeHart and Wings Hauser, both of whom are framed by William Smith's corrupt police lieutenant, Normad. Any... <laughs> Booted off the force, they spend their days shooting and drinking, fighting and drinking, ironing and drinking, and drinking and drinking, but keep finding themselves back in Normad's orbit due to him also being a corrupt judge, a drug kingpin, and the leader of a satanic cult. We love you, Satan! DeHart approaches the movie like an audition tape, and at one point it stops dead for him to do a soliloquy from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, 
or take up arms against the sea of trouble by opposing in them. Everyone who sees Get Even, the best known version of the movie, loves this scene. So let me tell you it's more than twice as long in Champagne and Bullets. And enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. <laughs> Bravo! Be warned though, if you don't watch the lower resolution Get Even version, you won't get to see camcorder footage of a 10 years older DeHart doing kung fu and feeding his poodle. Do a little dance. Good girl, a little martial artist. Good baby. Clearly our hero's no actor, so it's surprising the worst performances in the movie come from the seasoned pros. Wings Hauser ad-libbed much of his dialogue, which due to him being hammered, tends to be incomprehensible. Ed? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get... I'll... This is one of the drunkest performances I've ever come across, and I've seen 22 Jan Michael Vincent movies. Barkey, I would like another drink, okay? But at this time, at this point in place, right, I'd like something with some class, okay? So give me a classy drink. It looks like DeHart's decided it's easier to just let him run and try to fit the movie around whatever he wants to shout about. I mean, the, uh, Huckleberry Finn is beyond, is beyond Moses leading uh, the Israelites, you know, out of every, wherever they came from, into the promised land. I'm talking, I'm talk, I'm talking Huckleberry Finn. Smith is little better. Like so many faded stars trading on past glories for a quick paycheck, he seems to require a chair and a script at all times, and even then struggles with his dialogue. Well, they pulled into this, uh, what I would call a pe pe what I would call a panderer's vehicle. De Hart wound up abandoning the film industry for a career in law, but somewhere in a parallel universe, there's an earth on which he made it as an actor, and another on which he's a major recording artist. Steve Barquette's best known to cult movie fans for the aftermath, but that's only because Empire of the Dark's too good for us. Barquette plays Richard Flynn, a cop who discovers a dimensional portal leading to the underworld, where Satanist Richard Harrison sacrificing Flynn's girlfriend. Things end badly. Two decades later, he's acquired a detective agency, a mustache and a new girlfriend. And despite no longer being a cop, remains dedicated to keeping people safe. Or using them as human shields in gunfights he started. What's important is the guy stealing food didn't get away with it. He looks good down there. And Flynn had a killer one-liner ready. That's where it belongs. But the hungry homeless are the least of his problems because the satanic cult's back and it wants him dead. You have to get up pretty early in the morning to get one over on Richard Flynn, though. Empire of the Dark is an incredibly rich B-movie. Every new scene seems to introduce us to another memorable character and deliver something by way of genre goodness, whether action, horror, or even melodrama. Are, are you trying to, to tell me that... Yes, Mr. Flynn. Terry Nash is your son. The sets exude lo-fi charm. The score is a superb old Hollywood adventure throwback. The effects are so delightful they take in a stop-motion demon. It's a fantastic film. Barquette himself's a true gent and committed genre fan who enjoyed a varied and highly successful career outside cinema. He's also one of the few delusioneers on this list to make a profit from his film. Bullshit. It's true, his investor paid him handsomely to make it and he retains the rights. Sadly, he didn't direct again, but he's a welcome presence in a string of 90s B-movies produced by old buddy Fred Olin Ray. I do not understand. How is it possible for a god to die? Speaking of god... Who am I? What am I? Former Las Vegas real estate agent and high-functioning cinematic egomaniac Neil Breen first answered the call of the megaphone in 2005 with Double Down. 
a freeform experimental masterpiece that's arguably come to define modern ego exploitation. I was the first in my class in college in computer science. I won many medals for distinguished service. I can start and end wars. I've received bio, electro, medical I implants. I controlled access to the national geos. I control access to anything and everything. I don't need much to live on anymore. I just eat tuna out of the can and live in the car. Next came I Am Here, now in which Breen put the humility of Double Down behind him to truly embrace his inner narcissist as an omnipotent cyborg space god here to judge mankind. This isn't the way I planned your species. But it wasn't until his third and most conventional offering, 2013's Fateful Findings, that he really made a name for himself. To be honest, I'm reluctant to single out just one of Neil's films to represent the apex of ego exploitation and by extension the pinnacle of humanity's combined creative endeavours. I'd prefer to present them en masse as an interconnected mega experience, but we need a number one and Fateful Findings is the obvious choice. I've been hacking into government and corporate international secrets all over the world. And I'm going to expose them all. It's the story of a novelist and conspiracy theorist named Dylan, who as a child finds a magic thing and as an adult gets hit by a car. <laughs> It releases some kind of force within him, and what follows is classic Neil. Most of the movies shot in his house, which I know better than my own. I've tracked those sheets through four movies and five bedrooms. Here the house doubles not only for a hospital, but also all the homes we see, including Jim and Amy's, which means those sheets had to go back to the guest room. Jim's infamous death actually takes place in Neil's garage next to his prized Ferrari Testarossa. I can't help you out of this one, Jim. In common with all Neil's films, the notion of a plot's irrelevant. His interests, aside from having naked blonde women lie on his bedsheets, are confined to self-mythologizing, conspiracy theorizing, and listing all the people he'd like to execute. Why do you keep saying that? Why? I know I have issues. The extent to which we give him a pass on this is quite something, considering that in most of his films, he endorses extinction-level slaughter and ends with a mass suicide. Goodbye. After Fateful Findings came Pass Through, if anything an unexpected backward step on Neil's creative arc as a filmmaker because it's basically a rerun of I Am Here, now. Not that it matters. This is my universe! I will kill you! I will eliminate all of the people like you! You are done! No, you are done! I'm done! Done! His fifth and most recent film, Twisted Pair, marks a stylistic change of direction and offers the great man a dual role that includes an AI superhero, about the only manner of pseudo-deity he hasn't already played. It's time to end his global plans. They can't stop. Whether your interest in good-bad movies is casual or committed, I urge you to watch Neil's work. Some might argue that he's become self-aware, like a rhesus macaque, or indeed a human. Uh, but I've actually dealt with him, so it's not a concern I share. No more damn books! No more books! That's how the conversation usually goes. So that's it. A subjective take on 10 of the best worst ego exploitation vanity projects of the last decades. Although I think I recommended twice as many, and there are plenty of others. You killed my son. Now I am going to kill you, just as I killed your father. You killed my father. Now I'm going to kill you, just like I killed your son. I hardly touched on pioneers like Uli Lamel or the recent digital wave spearheaded by the likes of Vitaly Versace. And I could spend a whole video talking about Shatner's Groom Lake. Tell myself, let go, let go. Fear is fiction, physics is truth. Hold on to science. Maybe next time. Thanks for watching and see you again soon. Where are my pills? I'll be with you when you need me. Something I've got to know right now.